My job this evening is to uh, tell you initially a little bit about the physics of the magnetic poles. And uh, you can see in this uh, diagram a, uh, a cartoon of the Earth. You have the, uh, the thin shell around the outside, which is the Earth's crust. This large uh, area, large zone of plastic material, the mantle. And then uh, the centre part of the Earth where it gets very hot is predominantly liquid iron. And that liquid iron is moving around, it carries electric currents and that produces a magnetic field. So the, the main magnetic field of the Earth is illustrated by these red lines and it emanates from the Earth's core. Now, if you had a, a freely suspended magnetic compass, then those compasses would align themselves along those red lines. So the lines are a simple way of describing the pattern of the Earth's magnetic field. And what you'll notice is that there are two principal points, one in the northern part and one in the southern part of the Earth, where the magnetic field is vertical. And around uh, an equatorial region, the magnetic field is actually horizontal to the Earth's surface. So those two principal points uh, define the Earth's magnetic poles. This is the earliest known uh, magnetic compass. It's uh, actually called a geomancer's tablet. It was uh, invented and used by the Chinese about 2,000 years ago. It consists of a bronze base plate, and on top of that is a Chinese-type spoon, which is carved out of magnetic oxide of iron. And so, uh, with a, a highly polished surface, that spoon can rotate, and it lines itself with a magnetic field. And what the Chinese would have found is that the, the spoon not only aligns itself with the horizontal direction of the field, but in different locations would tilt upwards or downwards at a different angle. So uh, even 2,000 years ago, um, there was a knowledge about the Earth's magnetic field. It took some 1,000 years before that reached the West. And uh, what was uh, realized about that time is that the, the magnetic field of the Earth is very similar to that of a very small uh, dipole magnet. And so uh, here you see a little uh, bar magnet, and around it the magnetic field pattern it produces. That happens to be exactly the same as the pattern you'd get from a uniformly magnetized sphere. Now that field is produced predominantly by uh, the events I described in the Earth's liquid core. And what you see in this diagram is a, a map, and it's, a, it's actually a projection of the entire Earth's surface stretched out. And it's showing you the vertical component of the magnetic field over the Earth's surface. And blue is downwards, and the orange-red colors are magnetic field coming upwards. And as you go down towards the Earth's <laughs> liquid core, the magnetic field pattern becomes more complicated. And that illustrates what it's like close to the boundary between the mantle and the core at a depth of about 3,000 kilometers. And what you see is that the, the fluid motion in the Earth's liquid core, it has a viscosity similar to water, uh, is quite uh, vigorous. The magnetic field pattern changes quite a lot, and you see that at the Earth's surface. So it's no surprise that uh, the two magnetic poles move around. They're not diametrically opposite and they don't coincide with the geographic poles. Now, that's not the only motion of the Earth's magnetic field. And the surface of the Sun uh, produces external electric currents around the Earth. And we're seeing here a picture of uh, a quiet time on the left and a disturbed time on the right on the Sun when there are lots of sunspots. And we're running through a time sequence again here. And from time to time, in different places, there are large ejections of plasma, electrically charged particles, from the surface of the sun. It's a very, very dynamic place. And these images are shown in extreme ultraviolet light. The, the Earth would be uh, very small compared with one of those sunspots. So the effect of this very dynamic sun is to produce a wind of electrically charged particles, principally protons, which uh, uh, just emanate out from the sun, and they strike the Earth and the Earth's magnetic field. 
And this is what happens when that occurs. So we're uh, come, zooming in on the sun, and we're looking for a, an event called a coronal mass ejection, when a vast amount of material gets blown off from the surface of the Earth, from the surface of the sun, sorry, there it goes. And this goes spinning off into space, and on occasion strikes the Earth's magnetic field. The Earth is at the center here, and it's compressing the Earth's magnetic field, distorting it. And when these lines connect, they inject electric particles into the near-Earth environment, into the ionosphere at a height of one, two, three hundred kilometers. And there you see auroral displays around the two polar regions. This is an auroral display illustrating those uh, motions of charged particles in the ionosphere above us. So we have these two superimposed motions. There's the steady drift caused by the Earth's liquid core with typical velocities of 10 kilometers a year. And the superimposed upon that is the daily motion. If the sun is undisturbed, a very quiet time, that daily motion may be as little as 20 kilometers, could even be less. Uh, if there's a, a big magnetic storm like the simulation I showed you, then the daily motion of the, the pole could be as much as many hundreds of kilometers, even a thousand kilometers. So if you're trying to get to the magnetic pole and you get magnetically disturbed conditions on the sun, then the chances are you'll never get remotely close to it. So you have to be very lucky to get undisturbed conditions in the polar regions, which are relatively rare. Our knowledge about the Earth's magnetic field, of course, was driven very much by the quest for information about to where magnetic compasses point. Of course, for a very long time, compass navigation was really the secret to military and commercial success. And, uh, and that drove an enormous thirst for information about the magnetic field. Um, so uh, my introduction to this uh, was in 1975. And at that time, Dick Smith, who is a well-known figure here, uh, was organizing a commercial flight over Antarctica. Uh, he was flying in the vicinity of the magnetic pole, and he wanted somebody to come along who knew a little bit about the Earth's magnetic field to talk to people about it. So I was the, the lucky student then at the Australian National University who had that job. And so I, I started to uh, look into the history of exploration of the South Magnetic Pole, and to my amazement, I discovered the story you see illustrated here, that um, there had been a succession of expeditions, but very, very few attempts to reach the South Magnetic Pole. Uh, none of them had reached the South Magnetic Pole. The most recent one was in 1952 by uh, a French Jesuit priest, Pierre Noel Maillot. Um, and the distances they got to the magnetic poles are illustrated there. We did indeed uh, fly in the vicinity of the magnetic pole on that occasion uh, during Dick Smith's flight. And there was speculation then as to whether the magnetic pole was still on land because this succession of steps towards it indicated that the magnetic pole was moving for the reasons I described earlier and was drifting offshore uh, in the general direction of Australia. The best estimate I could make was that indeed the pole was offshore, perhaps by a distance of about 50 to 100 kilometers. The positions of the magnetic poles uh, were the original uh, Ross would have been stopped by the Transantarctic Mountains here, so he was in the, the Ross Sea area, and he estimated the pole to be about here. And then uh, the 1909 party would have got there, uh, Eric Webb here, Pierre Mayo there, and I'm not quite sure, but generally the pole was moving in a trajectory like this, and it, I estimated it would be out here. So the question is, how, how do you find it now it's at sea, if indeed it was at sea? And um, <clears throat> the, the sort of instruments which people had used are illustrated here. Um, that is, in fact, a, a Chinese, an ancient Chinese compass, which is a, uh, a magnetized fish floating on a dense liquid, which is quite an effective uh, compass and it can be used at sea. And then the various forms of magnetic compass, a ship's compass, um, and this is called a trough compass. 
It's really just a, a plain ordinary compass but with extremely long needle and that gives you very accurate measurements of the horizontal direction of the field. And the horizontal direction of the field tells you which way to go to get to the magnetic pole. If you started even from here and you followed uh, the direction of your magnetic compass southwards, it would lead you to the south magnetic pole, but it wouldn't get you there directly. You'd go along a wiggly path. And these dip circles, which uh, Lindell described, this just illustrates the principle of a dip circle. It's a compass pivoted such that it swings in a vertical plane and will tell you what the, uh, the dip of the magnetic field is. And this is an illustration of the sort of compass uh, dip circle which Mawson would have used. And, and so these dip measurements would tell you how far you are from the pole. The angle of dip is related to how far from the pole. 